So I've got my sermon notes, I've got my Bible, I've got my tea. I thought about setting out Kleenex and sanitation lotion as well, but I'll keep my distance from you. We're wrapping up our, our final sermon in our series on Breaking Addictions, The Road to Victory. The more I read, the more I listen to the news, the more I interact with people, the more grieved I am about how in bondage people are to sin. I know my own life. I know the things that I <clears throat> am given toward. I like food. How about you? Right? Food is good, but enough to energize us to serve the Lord and no more. That's difficult. I like sleep. Now, I don't require a lot of sleep. If I get six hours of sleep, I'm, I'm energized. Some of you need more like 16 hours of sleep to be energized. Sleep is a good thing, but how much? And the reality is we need enough where we can serve the Lord. Everything that we've been given, everything that we are, everything that we have is for one purpose, to serve the Lord. That's it. We work our jobs, not to make money so that we can provide for our family, but so that we can give. We, we have families, not so that we can have some status symbol in the community, because God is worth more, worthy of more worshipers. Uh, we get married, not just to fulfill some desire that we have, but because no one in the world could help our spouse grow into the image of Jesus Christ like us. And that's our goal. Our goal is to please God and glorify God in everything that we do. And when we need to begin to put on that mindset of this is all about God. Everything is from Him and to Him and for Him. Well, let me summarize. Um, today we're talking about victory means being equipped to battle our addictions. Again, addictions, we're going to define it biblically, but Ephesians chapter 6, and bear with me, I'm, I'm going to try not to raise my voice much today. That's not going to work, I know already. But um, Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 20. Some of you new here may not have a Bible, but you might have a smartphone. You can download an app called Logos, L-O-G-O-S. Logos, you'll find it's like a magnifying glass with a cross in it. Uh, that's a free app that's out there, and actually when it comes a verse comes up here it'll come on your phone and so that's cool you know you can download it later <laughs> <laughs> if you got your bibles you can follow along i'm reading now the esv ephesians 6 10 to 20 finally be strong in the lord and in the strength of his might put on the whole armor of god that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. And, as, and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. It's important this is in your notes it's important to summarize what we've studied up to this point 
And, and what I've done is just taken those four points that we have on the board over there and, and basically just summarize them. Number one, if we're really honest, as if we're really honest, we know, we all know that addictions are not sin, or are sin, not sickness. We know that they're not sickness. Uh, the alcoholic um, is sickness, common cold, is something that you didn't go shopping for. Uh, a, a sickness is something that comes upon you that you really don't have control over. Uh, that bottle of alcohol, you've got complete control over. That package of cigarettes, you've got complete control over. You have control over these things that are addictions. Look at 1 John chapter uh, 1. 1 John 1, verses 8 through 10. 1 John 1, 8 through 10. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. It's not a sickness. It's a sin. It's a choice. Uh, the Bible talks about not making any provision for the flesh to satisfy its lusts. As difficult as it is to go without whatever that thing is that's captured you, you have responsibility as a Christian to not go there. Two, addictions are the result of using our God-given habit capacity for pleasure rather than for serving God. Our God-given habit capacity for pleasure rather than for serving God. Romans chapter 1, verse 25. Because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. God has given us this wonderful ability to create habits. Habits are a wonderful thing because you don't have to think about them. They just, they kick into autopilot. Um, if you've been driving for a while, you don't have to relearn how to drive every time you go to the car. It's just automatic. Um, they're, they're, this habit capacity is a God-given gift, but under the curse of sin, it's been twisted. And now we as sinners use our capacity for habits to serve our flesh rather than to serve God. And, and we need to break that capacity. We need to break that habit so that we're pleasing God with everything we do because we were made for him and by him. And so we need to make sure that the habits that we're creating, the habits that we have in our lives are the habits that are going to bring glory to God and not bring shame on his name. Number three, in order to have victory, there must be a transformation of the inner person. Real victory ha it starts with the heart. It starts with the inner person. If all we're doing is behavior modification, then what we're doing is we're taking off a habit over here and we're replacing it with another habit over here that isn't necessarily godly. Behavior modification really is replacing one habit with another. Now, in the psychological world, the, the part that they forget or the part that they can't handle is not the putting off. They'll, they know that you need to break that addiction to, to, um, to drugs. They know that you need to break that addiction to alcohol. But then what do you put in place of it? And if it's not a biblical, truly biblical replacement, then it's just going to be another sin. Uh, smokers, when they stop smoking, they turn many times to candy or eating. And, and that leads to other problems. When we put off a habit, we've got to replace it with something. You think about just digging up an old tree. We had a bunch of trees removed around here. Um, and, and when they got them all dug out and we got the, the stumps ground out, 
we were left with this just this gigantic hole. Now we had the choice not to fill them, but they would get filled over time. They would get filled with garbage, they would get filled with leaves, they'd get filled with bodies, all kinds of things, <laughs> but they would get filled with something. Right? So, so we thought it was good stewardship to bring in some good dirt and fill them with something that was profitable so that we could grow grass on them again and spend more money on uh, gasoline for mowing the lawn. But we, we thought it was good stewardship to do that and not let accidents happen, not let just nature take its course and fill them accidentally. We wanted to fill them on purpose with a purpose. And that's what we have to do with our habits. To replace a habit, you've got to fill it with something godly, not with randomness. And that's where the world goes wrong. Uh, what they tend to fill it with is drugs that just mess with the mind. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. That's that inner transformation that needs, needs to take place. A, par, a large part of uh, being able to create new habits is having a transformed spirit, a transformed thinking. Number four, real victory lasts because we've changed the way we think about life and sin. Real victory lasts. It's, it's an enduring thing. Not because it's a one and done, but because we've changed the way we think about that sin. We don't want to go back there anymore. We don't want to visit that anymore. We don't want to be around those people that help us to sin. What we want to do is we want to put that off and we want to replace it with those things that are going to keep us from going back to that sin. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 22 to 24. Ephesians 4, 22 to 24. To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. And to be made new in the spirit of your minds and put on the new self created to created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. The reason that you put off and put on is because you've changed the way you think. And when the Spirit of God changes the way you think, and you surrender that to God, and, and you begin to see sin as something derogatory and negative and harmful in your life, and you want to put on those behaviors that are pleasing to God, then you, you're going to put in place a mindset that will keep you from going back to that. You're going to put these speed bumps in your life that will keep you from going back to that. Now, understand, if in your mind you let down your guard, nothing can keep you from going back there. No one will keep you from going back there because you'll go back there. It's not just a matter of the will. It's a matter of being transformed in our will through the blood of Jesus Christ and the power of the cross. Ultimately, Victory is only available to those who are in Christ. That's the qualifier. Now, people can break habits, and, and people who aren't Christians break habits all the time, but they don't replace them with godly habits. Replace them with godly habits. So, we, we're going to talk quite a bit about being in Christ, because that's ultimately what this passage are in the armor of God is. Being in Christ, let's start with this theological premise, being in Christ is the responsibility of God. We cannot choose to be in Christ. That's a, that's a hard concept, but in order to understand that, we've got to go back to the very first chapter of the book of Ephesians. By the way, if you haven't uh, listened online to our series on Ephesians, it was a couple years ago, um, it took almost a year to go through the book of Ephesians, but a very, very theological book, the most theological book in the New Testament. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. And then the in love actually starts with the next, the next section. In being in Christ, that salvation process, 
That's God's job. God does that. We're going to talk about how that happens in just a bit here. Interesting facts for you. I like, I like different facts, but in, in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 through 13, there are ten times there's a reference to being in Christ. It might be in Him, in the Beloved, in Christ, but ten times in 13 verses there's a reference to being in Him or in Christ. You can find those, and I've got those verses listed for you in verse 1, 4, 6, 7, 9, 10, 11, 12, and twice in verse 13. So 10 times in 13 verses. So this being in Christ must be a significant issue. And really, we, we didn't choose him. He chose us before the foundation of the world. And he drew us to himself. If you're, if you're a believer or you're here and you're not a believer yet, you're in the process of being drawn. And God in his love chose you, drew you to himself so that he could redeem you at his time and in his time. Now, when we yield, when I, when I came to Jesus Christ, I was um, in high school. Uh, I grew up in a home where uh, Jesus was a swear word. And uh, I didn't really know anything, wasn't really a church-going guy, made fun of people who did. But one day... Uh, through a series of events, I started going to this Baptist church in Indiana, and the preacher uh, talked with me, and I understood, I understood I needed Jesus. Now, why did I understand that? It wasn't because I'm such a bright guy. It's because God was drawing me to himself. He initiated it on his part. I responded because that's what he wanted me to do. That was his desire for me. And I turned to Jesus Christ in the privacy of my own home and received Jesus Christ as my Savior. Why did I receive Jesus? Because I willed it? Because God willed it. It was God's desire that I be saved. It doesn't take away human responsibility. But understand, when God is drawing, you get to that place in your life where all I want is Jesus. That's all I want. I don't want some human contraption. I don't want some philosophical uh, argument. I want Jesus and an intimate relation with him. Now, in the book of Ephesians, it's very clear as you read through that, and we took a long time to go through chapter 1, but in Ephesians, it refers to being in Christ at least, and I went through and counted them, at least 32 times. That's pretty significant when you say that the theme then of Ephesians is something to do with being in Christ. And it starts off with, this is not your idea. This is God's idea. So when we, when we understand that it starts with in Christ and it ends with in Christ, then, then we have to understand that the whole armor of God argument or a whole armor of God section is about Christ. So when Paul begins the section on the armor of God, he refers us back to the in him perspective. It refers us back to the in him perspective. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, he's wrapping this whole thing up. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. He didn't say, now just kind of buck up under this. You can do it. Positive thinking. Just will yourself there. You've got no, you've got no strength. Um, there is strength only in residing in Christ. Now, that's the only way to have real victory over sin is being in Christ. Be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. The word strength in our verse, in verse 10, means to cause to be able or to give strength or to strengthen. In other words, if we're being uh, uh, strong in his strength, then that strength that we have is derived from him. It's not inherent in me. I have no strength. We find this when 
uh, the Apostle Paul was converted. In, in Acts chapter 9, before we find in Acts chapter 7, we find this man named Saul who was persecuting the church, hated it. I mean, if there's anybody who hates it more, it's probably Satan himself. Okay, but he hated the church, was persecuting people. He gave the thumbs down when Stephen was killed. They stoned him to death. They were lay, laying their garments at the foot of this young man named Saul. And Saul was on the fast track to this political hierarchy, this religious hierarchy. And he, he got permission from the chief priest to go throughout the countryside and arrest people who claimed to be Christians, followers of the way, as the church was first called. And then God meets him, literally blinds him, and presents himself to Saul. And they have this little conversation. And Jesus asks Saul, this is after Jesus has been crucified and ascended into heaven, Jesus presents himself to Saul and says, why are you persecuting me? That's a wonderful question. And Saul, being blind, because of God's great light, said, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus whom you're persecuting. And he has this encounter with Jesus. And, and he comes to faith in Jesus Christ, not because he willed it, but because God willed it, intervened in his life, drew him to himself. And in Acts chapter 9, verse 22, we read this about that man, Saul. But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. Interesting that he was in Damascus because Damascus was his, where he was headed to arrest Christians. Now, think if you're, if you're in Damascus and this guy named Saul is coming and you know he's got letters from the chief priest, you're, you're just going to be really tickled that he's coming to town. Now, he's, he's been converted, but he's still got this reputation. And now he gets back into Damascus and instead of arresting or persecuting believers in Jesus Christ, he's affirming Christ to them. Why the change? Not because he wanted it, because God wanted it. And God changed him from the inside out and created him this transformed spirit, this brand new thinking, and now he's no longer a persecutor of Christ, but he's being persecuted for Christ. That's what it means to be born again. It means to yield to Jesus Christ, surrender your life to the Lord, receive Jesus Christ as Savior, and live a brand new, transformed life, not going back to the old ways, but living in a brand new way for the Lord, thinking about life differently. Instead of being a persecutor of Christ, being one who promotes Christ. So there's only strength in residing in Christ, and second, there's Christ's strength is mightier than our strength. As strong as you might think you are, Christ is stronger. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. Breaking in the middle of a section, the Apostle Paul, the one who was converted, the one who kept increasing in strength, said, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead that same power that God exerted in the life of Christ and Jesus Christ second person of the Trinity God with flesh raised himself up that same power that resurrected Jesus from the dead is the same power that transformed your life when you yield to Jesus Christ the same power. So now we, we move to this armor of God section. Armor of God. It's not really that mystical. It's kind of cool when you really come to understand it. The armor of God is Jesus Christ. That's it. The armor of God is Jesus Christ. It's not something special that we put on. It's Jesus Christ. It's living in the strength that he gives. 
It's living in the power that he gives. Jesus withstood the attack of Satan. That's the kind of power that we have. He withstood the attack of Satan. Ephesians 6, 11, talking about the armor of God. Notice this, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. God doesn't ask us to do something that Jesus hasn't already accomplished. He never takes us where Jesus hasn't already gone. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, Jesus gets baptized by John the Baptist, and the Spirit then leads, uh, then Jesus was led up, up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. For 40 days, Jesus knows that it's one onslaught after another for 40 days, 40 days of fasting, 40 days of temptation, culminating in the big three of the temptation that we know about in Scripture, and, and he wins. We couldn't win ever without Jesus. Couldn't win ever without Jesus. Jesus won because he has inherent power. We have derived power. Our power is not in ourselves. Our power is in Jesus. Jesus' power is in himself. He has a power that you and I cannot have outside of faith in him and surrender to him. If you want to break the cycle of sin, the only way to do that is to call upon and live in the power of Jesus Christ who conquered the devil, who conquered Satan. Jesus' battle was against satanic forces, not against the Pharisees. We, we know that he battled the Pharisees, but ultimately he didn't really battle the Pharisees. He was still battling satanic attack. Ephesians 6.12 We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. We, we, got, we have this spiritual unseen battle going on that really isn't from the outside. People may say bad things to you. People may say hurtful things to you. People may do things to you, treat you badly. People may uh, abuse you. But really, all they can do is touch the outside. Your real battle, it starts here and goes here. It's all internal. Your negativism, your critical spirit, your argumentative attitude, your desire to seek peace at any cost, your desire to please yourself, that's not anything anybody can force on you. It's in you. It's in you. Your battle isn't against flesh and blood. Your battle's against that war that rages right in the heart of you. And Satan is the chief of the ones who wants to win that battle. Jesus Christ already won it. He already won it. And we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We need to remember that. Our battle's not against those pre people giving us a hard time. Our battle's against that thing going on inside of us where we want, we lust, we fight for the approval of people. We fight for their, their affection, their attention, their approval, their, their whatever it is. They want. We fight for that. And it all is in here. Jesus talking to the Pharisees in John 8, 44. He said, you are of your father the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he's a liar and the father of lies. And Jesus knew that when the Pharisees lied about him, when they hired their false witnesses, when they said all kinds of derogatory things, they were only speaking because their father, the devil, had willed it. That was why they spoke the way they did. And he realized that while it was coming from flesh, it was ultimately coming from the ruler of darkness, Satan. So we need to keep that perspective. Everything that attacks us, 
Everything that causes us to question, does God really love me? Is life really worth living? How, what's the point in all of this? All those attacks, all those negativism, all that critical stuff going on inside, it's not really the people around. It's already in me. And I have to do battle with that. And you have to do battle with that. So let's talk about this armor stuff. Since Jesus won the battle, we must clothe ourselves with the same attitude as Jesus. The, 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 the armor of God isn't something physical we can pick up. The armor of God is about living in Christ. Verse 13, Paul is using the military concept of the day to reinforce what it means to live a godly life. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, not just pieces you like. It's an all or nothing. Take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the evil day and having done all, to stand. Quitting is not standing. Complaining is not standing. Giving in to your sinful desires is not standing. Standing means responding like Jesus Christ did. You might say, well, that's impossible. Exactly. Without Jesus Christ in your life, it is impossible. You can't do it to the glory of God. You can't speak, think, act, behave to the glory of God if Christ isn't in you and you're not in him. Romans 13, verse 14. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Not just pieces you like. Put on Christ and make no provision of the flesh to, to gratify its desires. Ever. Not even a little bit. Are, are you feeling like you're overwhelmed right now? Because you should be. This is a battle we will, that rages in us and will rage till we die. And then once we're in heaven, we'll never have this battle again. That doesn't mean you get to skip to heaven. Okay? That, that's not the purpose. The purpose is this progressive sanctification that we're, if we're in Christ, that's what we're part of. We're growing and changing in Christ. And what that means is that every day when I sin, because you and I are going to sin every day, when I sin, I'm confronted with another opportunity to repent, to put it off, to change my thinking, and to put on the new behavior. The behavior that glorifies God. Every day. Multiple times during the day. Sometimes it will feel like that's all I do all day. That's why Jesus told Peter when he said, how many times do I have to forgive my brother? There's got to be a limit to this, right? I mean, is there, it, just give me the line. Once he crosses that line, I'm going to lay a smack down. There's no line. Jesus put, he says 490 times or six, 7 times 70 or 7 times 7, whatever, however your Bible translates that. What it was is this is a number out there. I mean, I get offended if somebody offends me twice in a day. Really, just once in a day will do it, but uh, twice in a day with the same sin. Right? But Jesus is saying, look, if it's 49 or 490, it's irrelevant. It's a number beyond what most of us are willing to do. And the point is this. In our flesh, we can't do it. I can't even do it once right in my flesh. I need to be walking in the spirit I need to be in Christ I need to be strengthened in Christ if I'm ever going to do battle with this sin that keeps attacking me and it always attacks me in here and, and so by confronting my sin and when God creates those those wonderful opportunities for me and, and I instead sin when I do that uh those are opportunities that God has ordained that I can see my sin and repent of it. So let's talk about the pieces of the armor. Every piece of the armor of God points to Jesus. These are not to be taken separately. It's, it's a whole package. It's, it's all or nothing. First of all, the belt of truth the belt of truth. Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the truth. If you don't start with truth, nothing else matters. 
Ephesians 6, 14, stand therefore having fastened on the belt of truth. Again, Paul is just using military um, symbols or, or pictures of the day to show what it means to, to be in Christ. So having fastened on the belt of truth, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's it. There's no other way. All roads do not lead to heaven. One road leads to heaven, and Jesus said it's really narrow, and there's only a few people who find it. Broad is the path that leads to destruction. That's the one most people are on. But there is a path that leads to heaven. It's one path. It's a narrow path, and only a few people are going to find it. If you found it, don't take pride in the fact you found it because you couldn't even find it without Jesus. Right? He, he leads you to it, and he is the truth. He is that road. The breastplate of righteousness. Jesus is the righteous one. You can't, first of all, you can't believe a lie about Jesus and be strengthened in Christ. If he's the truth, then we must believe the truth about him or we're believing a lie, and therefore it's not of the Lord. The breastplate of righteousness, Jesus is the righteous one. Verse 14, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. I'm not going to go, and there's been a lot of sermons on what each of these things means. It's, I think the, the passage is really irrelevant about what the breastplate looked like, or what the belt looked like, or what the shoes looked like, or the helmet. It's irrelevant. The point is not the things. The point is everything in life is about Jesus. Everything about this victory is about Jesus. 1 John 2, 1. The apostle John, who was the closest human to Jesus on earth, said, My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. We don't have any inherent righteousness. All we have is a derived righteousness. That tickle just started. We have no inherent righteousness. <clears throat> this will make a great sermon for next week. <laughs> All right, I think we're good. Let's move on. Three, the shoes or the boots, if you will, some people say. The shoes, the gospel of peace. Jesus is the prince of peace. He's the prince of peace. Verse 15. And as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. <clears throat> Isaiah 9, 6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of peace. One thing we need to say about peace, and that is this, this is masterfully put misconception about peace. And it really leads to a multitude of cop outs. Well, I can't do that because I don't have peace about it. Or I need to do that because I, I, I prayed about it and I really have peace about that. I just, just right now, let's all go, Bleh. That's not scripture in any shape, way, or form. Not even a little bit. 
Peace is not about decision making. Peace is about living for Jesus under struggles and trials and tribulation. I, have, I am very at peace about a lot of sins that I commit. And I really don't have peace about a lot of things Jesus wants me to do. I find a lot of turmoil in my life about that. Uh, this whole idea of making decisions based upon peace comes back to our, our contemporary um, emphasis on feelings. I just don't feel right about that. Who cares? Right? You know, you've, you've been here long enough to know that I, I'm not a kind of a feelings oriented. I have feelings. I get my feelings hurt once in a while. But the real emphasis on Christian living is not how we feel. It's about obedience, whether I feel like it or not. That, that's, that's what the, the truth of a Christian is. Am I going to honor God whether I feel like it or not? I don't feel like it today, so that gives me a pass because I don't have peace about living for Jesus today. It's, it's ridiculous. Jesus is the Prince of Peace, not because that helps us make, the, make decisions, but because in our struggles, in our turmoil, in those things that, that would make most people fall, we can live at peace, a peace that transcends understanding, that keeps our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Not about making decisions. It's about living for Jesus. So, okay, we're just going to take care of that bad theology. I'm, I'm not going to, like, beat you for saying I don't have peace about it, but um, you can expect a correction because I love you enough to not let you speak lies. Okay? Decision-making is not how good I feel about it. Decision-making is about does it please God? Does it glorify Him? And, and am I willing to do right even if I don't feel like it. Okay, that's a little rant. The throat held up for that, so that was good. <laughs> Let's talk about the shield of faith. The shield of faith. Jesus is the reason for our faith. Right? If you don't start with truth, everything else is going to be skewed. And if you don't start with the truth about Jesus, you really won't stand and and you really won't have a faith that's going to be able to quench those, those fiery darts. Jesus is the reason for our faith. Verse 16 of Ephesians 6. In all circumstances, no matter what you face, any time of the day, any day, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. We, we really do overemphasize the fact that Satan is flinging darts at us. I don't want to minimize that with, with all that the, the pastors and their wives. and the, I'm beginning to rethink my whole demonology thing. But, um, but the reality is not the darts. It's not that Satan attacks us. The reality is this. Where's, what's my faith in? Is my faith in somehow in my inherent ability to please Jesus or, or is my faith in Jesus who has inherent ability to please the Father because if my faith is in me I'm going to fall um, but if my faith is in Jesus I will never fall how's that for a concept if Jesus Christ lives in us do we have to sin? We don't have to sin, ever. Not even once. We have the power because of the indwelling trinity. Right? Because, because the trinity can't be compartmentalized. We don't just have Jesus. We have the Spirit of God and we have the Father indwelling in us. If we have that much power in us, why do we sin? It comes down to one reason. I want to. I want to. I've evaluated life, and I believe that at this moment I deserve to sin. Really? What's that say about all this power of God within you? In all circumstances, doesn't matter what people did or didn't do to you, you still don't get a pass on pleasing Jesus. 
The only way to win this is to have faith, to take up that shield of faith. Romans 10, 17, so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. If you're going to be a person who has faith, you cannot divorce it from a reading of the scriptures on a daily basis. Can't do it. If you're a person who's kind of ditched the reading of the Bible for some more contemporary book, then you're not going to be able to stand. Faith comes from hearing and hearing from the Word of God, Word of Christ. 1 John 5, verses 4 and 5. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? It's not faith in me. It's not faith in all that I've learned. It's not faith in some inherent ability or some prestigious position that I have. It has to be faith in Jesus Christ who loved me and gave himself for me. The helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation. Jesus is the one who saves us. And by the way, he doesn't save us because we're special. He saves us in spite of us being dirt balls. He saves us in spite of us being rebels. He's, he saves us in spite of us sinning and falling short. He saves us in spite of that. When you think about the holiness of God, which is beyond our understanding, you think about the sinfulness of man, which is beyond our understanding, why would God love us? I know me. I'm amazed my wife loves me, let alone a holy God. I know some of you. We're just going to leave it there. Uh, why would God love us? There's nothing in us to love. Hebrews, or excuse me, uh, verse 17, and take up, the, take the helmet of salvation. Hebrews 7, 25, consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Jesus Christ lives to make intercession for us. He's always pleading to the Father on our behalf. Luke 19, verse 10. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. I am so thankful for that. He came to seek and to save the lost. Only when you understand you're lost can you be found. Sixth, the sword of the Spirit. Like Jesus, we must proclaim the Word of God into our trials. We have to make sure that we face trials the way Jesus faced trials. We don't get a pass on that. Verse 17, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And this, this word, word, is an interesting one because it's not the word logos, which is so many times used in the Scripture. It's the word rhema. The word rhema means a, a proclamation. It's a single unit used in a discourse or a statement. So this is like those, those times when we're, we're tested, we're tried, it's speaking into the moment. The word of truth, the word of God. Jesus did this and showed us how to do it in response to Satan's temptations. Jesus spoke the word of God into the moment and he said, we won't turn to these verses, but he said, it is written. His reliance, even though Jesus, second person of the Trinity, God with flesh, had the inherent power to dismiss Satan he instead relied upon those wor that word of God, the, the proclamation of the scripture into the moment. I find it very interesting that many people don't like that. I, I'm not sure I always like it, but 
you'll find that people say, when you're, when you're saying, well, you know, the Bible says this, they'll say something to the effect of, don't preach to me. Right? We tend to resist the speaking of truth into the moment. We tend to resist that. Why? Because we somehow think we're so stinking good. Or at least we're not as bad as that person who's correcting us thinks we are. And we need to be people who receive the word of God being spoken into the moment. Again, you can't speak the truth into the moment if you're not in the scriptures. And a wonderful thing happened when Jesus was tempted for those 40 days, and he's, three times he said, it is written, and responded with the word of God to Satan's argument and lie. In verse four, uh, 11 of Matthew chapter 4, it says, Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. I think oftentimes we, we go through this whole um, section on the spiritual armor, and we we give a great big discourse on what each piece of the armor means. It's about being in Christ. And, and if you're not living in Christ, you're going to believe lies. You're going to put your guard down. You're, you're going to stop standing in the gospel. Um, and you're going to stop using the word of God into the moment. And at that point, you're a sitting duck. You're, you're done for because... You've missed the most important thing, and that is that Jesus Christ is fighting that battle for you. And all you have to do is remain confident in him. If you're born again, there's no reason to move out of that. Just remain confident, strengthened in his might to do battle his way. And stop feeling sorry for yourself. And stop complaining. And stop going back to your sinful habits. Just break them and start moving forward. And you'll see God do wonderful things in your lives. And I don't realize that's, that might sound harsh. I have a cold. Um, <laughs> good excuses. Um, I don't mean to be harsh, but it is just that simple. There's no good reason to continue sinning. If you're in Christ, you've been given everything you need for life and godliness. Everything. So three things will reveal that we've, been clothed, we, that we've clothed ourselves with Christ. Three things. In Ephesians 6, 18, mentions those three. I have them underlined for you. Three things reveal that we've, been clothed, that we've clothed ourselves with Christ. Ephesians 6, 18. Praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Three things. Number one, prayer will be a priority of our lives. If we've clothed ourselves in Christ, if we're remaining in Him and we're strong in Him, we're going to be people of prayer. 1 Thessalonians 5.17, this just simple little verse that Paul used to say, pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. It doesn't mean you have to spend hours, spend hours on your knees, but throughout the day, as things happen, your go-to is going to be prayer. Throughout the day, your go-to is going to be prayer. It doesn't have to be a long, long, drawn-out prayer, and we don't have to tell God the scripture references that we're pointing to. He already knows them. He wrote the book. What we have to do is we just have to be faithful in praying. Two, we've got to be alert to the issues of life. Keep alert. Keep alert. Two things, two reasons to be alert. Number one, the devil's seeking to destroy you. If you're not alert, he will get you. He's relentless. He doesn't sleep. He has his minions everywhere, and they will attack you. 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. And if you're not alert, if you're not on guard, if you're not believing the truth, if you're not standing, you're going to fall. You're going to. 
It's not a matter of if. It's simply a matter of when. We have to keep alert. The second reason we need to keep alert is the Lord may return at any time. How do you want him finding you when he returns? The Lord may return at any time. Jesus is coming back. Do you agree with that? He's coming back. Mark 13, 35 to 37. Therefore, stay awake. Not physically stay awake. You'll die. Stay awake spiritually. Don't go to sleep spiritually. For you do not know when the master of the house will come. In the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or in the morning. Lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all. Stay awake. The church of Jesus Christ, I think for the most part today, is dead asleep. Dead asleep. Why? Because we're not preaching about sin anymore. We're not preaching about repentance anymore as a whole. We're not preaching about confession of sin. We're not preaching the things that are, that are vital to the church. Stay awake. Number three, persevere in prayer for others. Pray for yourself that God will strengthen you. That's the first thing. But second, pray for others. Persevere in prayer for others. That's what Paul said. With all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Romans 12, 12. Rejoice, rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Well, that's the armor of God. It's not really rocket science. It's about remaining in the strength that Christ gives. If you've never received Jesus Christ as your Savior, I'd love the opportunity to talk with you. Um, No greater joy than knowing that someone has been drawn by God to a point where they need to surrender to Jesus Christ. If you've got sinful habits in your life and, and uh, you, you've been struggling with them and you need some help, I'd love to pray with you, minister to you, um, just be there for you and help other Christians come around, come around you that can help you grow and change. Uh, there's no reason to continue on in sinful habits. Father, we want to thank you for your word. We want to thank you for the victory that's available to us through Jesus Christ. We want to thank you, Father, that you are a patient, loving God. that you don't repay us as our sins deserve. But that you are a forgiving God. And that when we come to to Jesus Christ, that you separate our sins from us as far as the east is from the west, and you choose to remember them no more. I thank you, Father, for the fresh start that's in Christ, and I pray that where we struggle, we'd be honest. that you would humble us and cause us to live for you. And I just want to praise you for each one here today and their commitment to knowing you. And I pray that you would continue to work in all of our lives as we keep surrendering to you in Jesus' name.